it is that time again. <clears throat> UFC 270 uh, predictions. Let's quickly talk about last week's card. The Geek and Chikotse versus Calvin Cater card. I just bit my tongue. Um, not a lot to say about it. The The main event was 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 a very, very good fight. Uh, Brandon Royal versus Rodrigo Bontarine was pretty fun. The um, rest of the card was pretty forgettable. Uh, pretty anticlimactic. I will say the one fight that I seem to disagree with public perception of was the Caitlin Chikagian versus Jennifer Maya fight. It seems like people thought that that was way better than they were expecting. It wasn't better than I was expecting. So I don't know. Maybe I maybe my expectations were like up here and your guys was down here. I don't know for that fight, uh, which is weird because I had pretty low expectations. It was pretty big negative about it in the video. And somehow maybe I was expecting better than everyone else. It wasn't a bad fight. It was just it was kind of a pointless one where pretty much the same dynamics played out as in the first fight. Um, I just wasn't terribly interesting in that regard. The story heading into UFC 270 has to be Francis Ngannou versus the UFC. Um, now, a lot of people are termed it that way, and I'm I'm not necessarily copying it because I came up with that idea uh, before I heard it, but... Um, it's not an original thought. We'll just put it that way. Um, because what what we have with Nganu is sort of a referendum, a microcosm of the exploitation of MMA fighters by the UFC. I've been through this before. I, I don't know why there isn't a unified problem with this in the with with MMA fans, because you'll have a lot of fans who will defend Dana White, defend the UFC about this. And I want to state one thing that somehow isn't really accepted. We can simultaneously critique Dana White and give him credit, respect, and so on for his role in making MMA and saving MMA as a sport. It can be done both. You can be good for a sport back in time in the past and be bad for it in the now and going forward. And that's basically where Dana White is. Um, and you owe, we owe him nothing as fans because by saving MMA and making it into a sport and making it palatable, making it shifting now, he has become a very, very rich man. The payment is there. The payment is, is literally the dollar sign. It's literally take my money. Um, we don't need to kowtow to him to defend him to handle anything else i'm going to try to avoid any he said he said with this whole thing like it could go really way deeper if we go with like francis and gano's accusations uh that dana white denies i'm going to try and stick with the things that are just either have been admitted to by dana directly or indirectly or that we have a paper trail via the antitrust lawsuit uh, the various ones that have gone on or that basically things that the receipts are in play for. So first up, this is the UFC heavyweight champion, Francis Ngannou versus Cyril Gaon, the UFC interim champion. This interim championship is kind of bullshit because Cyril Gaon won the interim title, uh, title, uh, back in August, 2021, early August, August 7th, Francis Ngannou won the title in March, late March, late March 27th, 2021. So a time gap of four months and change between them. About four months and about a week, two weeks. Four months, two weeks, we'll call it that. Separates those two. The justification has always been the UFC offered Dana a fight, or not Dana, uh, and got into a fight and he refused it. This is true. Um... Ngannou has never denied this. But the fight offered, according to him, and according to the UFC, was for about two and a half months after he won the title. Now, to be clear, the UFC usually does not make their champions fight within three months. It's virtually unheard of, uh, unless there's a controversial rematch to be had. That's far narrower time period 
than we have seen any other UFC champion defend their belt. So it was completely unnecessary. And it's also completely unnecessary because you're dealing with Francis Ngannou. His family is in Cameroon. He trains in the United States. There's the visa uh, refreshing issues there. You should never book a foreign-born, non-American citizen fighter in that short of a period of time, especially if they're going to travel home. So it was a ridiculous request. And the punishment was basically to do Gone versus Lewis because they really wanted Lewis to headline a fight in Houston, Texas, which is fair enough, but you could have done it other ways. And there has, of course, been the accusation that Gone is afraid to fight Lewis, or pardon me, that Nganu is afraid to fight Lewis or Gone, whichever suits the timetable for the UFC, which is quite ridiculous because the idea that fighters are ever afraid to fight other fighters is pretty stupid. Um, it's something that I hope I've never made a reference to on the video. I think there there may have been times where I talk about it being a bad matchup, not wanting the fight particularly, not campaigning for the fight. But when you're a champion, you're not going to be afraid to fight people. You're going to have to fight. Like there, there, there is no avoiding a showdown with, with Gone or Lewis because one of them is coming to the title shot at some point. That's just all there is to it. And the UFC apparently, again confirmed by Dana, offered Gone a significant amount of money. I've seen it reported at six hundred thousand or five hundred thousand to fight, and then I assume there's a winning bonus on top of that plus pay per view points. But let's call it, let's call it a million and a half dollars just to go high. For comparison purposes, John Jones apparently asked for Deontay Wilder money, which is about thirty million, and the UFC presented that as a this is ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? The GOAT, John Jones, wants comparable money to a top heavyweight boxer. The UFC always compares itself to boxing. We do better. We pay better. But your, your heavyweight champion's offer is about 130th. Let's say 120th. 120th of the comparable boxing numbers. It's kind of ridiculous. Like this, this whole fighter pay shouldn't even be a conversation within the fandom. The fighters are underpaid. There's no way around that. The argument I've seen presented is that, well, the USC fighters are interchangeable. It's really just the brand we're watching. There is some truth to that, but at the same time, the reason the UFC has built that brand logic was by putting on stat cards where the undercard mattered when boxing was not doing that and still is not doing that. So the fighters helped build that brand and get it to where it is and the ufc has not in any way compensated the fighters for the increase in value that the promotion has gotten off their backs it's pretty ridiculous and then there's the issues uh with uh dana insulting Ngannou's management uh markel martin who worked for the ufc at one point and apparently there's some bad blood there um something i will quickly say here is that the ufc liking your manager is actually a bad thing because here's, here's the thing. When, when you're dealing with business negotiation, the manager is supposed to be working for the fighter. The fighter is paying them. That's your, that's your client. You're representing their best interest. If the UFC really likes your manager, Ali, Adel Aziz, um, the Kawa brothers, um, Monty Cox used to be a go-to for them. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing. It's a good thing in the sense that you will get in the UFC, but you will get a UFC-friendly deal. And of course, the UFC contracts have been heavily critiqued on a legal level because of the various extension clauses within them. Ignoring the pay, the legality of the contracts has been questioned. So we have all of that coming into this. Now let's get to the fight. The fight dynamics between Ngannou and, and Gon are simple yet complex. Um, simple in the sense that I think the breakdown here is pretty simple. Gone is the more technical striker, the cleaner striker, the more varied striker, the more technical fighter in general, probably the better grappler of the two. Um, and Nganu is the, the beast fighter, essentially. The athletic specimen, the power, the explosiveness, the speed. Those are his advantages. So it's the physicality versus the technicality. 
uh, essentially. I think if this fight goes to decision, Gon will win. Um, I think over the course of, again, I think over the course of a round, Gon will have the better moments and, or will have the, the more complete game and, and the round winning style. Inganu will have the fight ending potential moments. I'm going to mix up uh, Inganu and Gon probably a fair bit here. I, the names are so similar. It's, it just sticks in my head. Um, but I'm going to go with Francis and Ganu here to win the fight, unify the belts, become heavyweight champion. Part of this may be my inherent want for him to win against the UFC. Uh, my inherent want to cheer against what the UFC wants given their exploitative labor practices. But I honestly believe that this is heavyweight. And being the fight that, fighter that can end the fight at heavyweight and has the physical tools is, I think, so very, very important. Um, because I think seldom do you see the technical fighter win that exchange against the raw power uh, at heavyweight. That's just the meta that exists at this division. And I think Francis Ngannou, at some point in this fight, will overwhelm Cyril Gaon and finish him with his strikes. So that's why I'm taking Big Francie to win. But I mean, if you're if you're backing Gaon to win, 100% feel free. I, I, I have no no problems with that assessment. Uh, in the co-main, we got the UFC flyweight title. Brendan Moreno, uh, David Zinfigueredo, these two, of course, have met uh, at the end of 2020, again in 2021, and now again in 2022. So basically every six months. Um, I think that over the first two fights, I've been far more impressed with Moreno in this matchup than I had been with Figueredo. Figueredo has had the big moments. He's, he's been the Francis Ngannou, if you will, of this breakdown. Moreno more the gone. But I think the key difference is that at flyweight, that technicality matters a ton more. That ability to keep pace and keep going. And the fact that Figueredo has not proven an ability to finish Moreno means that I kind of have to take the assassin baby Brandon Moreno to retain his belt. Um, as much as I think Figueredo would be the more dominant champ, he is the guy in the division that I see very few people actually challenging, whereas there are a lot of people that I do kind of see being able to challenge Brandon Moreno. Um, like, I, I guess a great example of this would be, I have no doubt that Divins, Davidson Figueredo would beat Brandon Royval. But I give Brandon Royval a shot against Moreno. And the same thing with like an Alexander Pantoja as well. Um, just because of how those matchups play. I just think that Moreno's specific abilities, specific volume, ability to push the pace, ability to not wilt in Figueredo's power translates to being able to beat Davidson Figueredo. So I'm taking him to win this fight, probably via submission again. A very similar fight to the second one. Um, I think if there was more time between the fights, like if we were talking a year and a half down the road as opposed to just six months down the road, I might have more faith in Figueredo to address um, the issues that he is that he has with this specific matchup. Him and the team at oh, he also also the fact that he trains at a team, team Figueredo, which is his own gym. Don't get me wrong, build, building your own gym is a, a big thing. Um, Tony Ferguson did a great job with it. Team Death Clutch with uh, Brock Lesnar, even Team Takedown with Johnny Hendricks. These are examples of that really working well. But I think that there isn't necessarily the infrastructure there to address the problems and. Uh, Close the gaps. So I, I do have to go with Brandon Moreno. And I think that's probably a weird thing to take in Gano and Moreno, just because I think that the the parallels are gone in Moreno and Figueredo in Gano. But um, that is what I'm going with. Um, welterweight fight Michel Prejea versus Andre Fial or Filao. Uh, taking, I'm taking Michael Pejea. Um so here, the issue with Bahia is that on a physical level and even on a technical level, I think he can beat all but like the very top of the division. The 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 Usmans, the Covingtons, the the Burnses, uh, the Leon Edwards is that kind of thing. I think even Edwards he could possibly beat. 
Um, but I think he can also lose to just about everyone because his style is so comically uh, all over the place, flash as opposed to substance. I mean, the man did lose to Tristan Connolly, um, who is a guy I have met and watched train um, at one point and was distinctly un- unimpressed with. Um, it was honestly very surprising to me when Tristan Connolly ended up in the UFC. It was, it was stunning. Um, I think it's shown that his only win is over Pereira or Pejea in uh, like non convincing fashion. It, it had more to, it had everything to do with what's wrong with Michelle Pejea and very little to do with Tristan Connolly. And that's why I'm always going to be rocky and not putting money down on it. But I, I don't, I don't see what Andre Filao offers that specifically is new or different to Peja that we haven't seen Peja overcome uh, previously. Uh, Cody Stabon versus Saeed Ragamadoff. I'm very interested in this fight. My my um excited side of my brain, I suppose wants to see Nurmagomedov win this fight because I think that Saeed Nurmagomedov is a difference maker, a excitement and needle mover in the division. I don't think Stavon is that. Stavon is a solid mid-level gatekeeper. If you can beat him, you might be ready for the top 10 of the division sort of thing. A guy who will hang around at like the number nine, number 10 rankings. Uh, and when I say rankings, I do mean like the, the rankings that I actually put merit in and not the UFC's rankings. The UFC's rankings have um, for a very, very long time lacked any real kind of um, logic to them. They are generally somewhat correct, but they struggle when it really comes down to it. So let's see here. What is Staman actually rated right now? Oh, he might be a little too low. He's 25th on the topology ratings, which are usually pretty decent. Let's have a look at the UFC rankings. I just said the UFC rankings aren't really worth a lot, but I am I am intrigued to see what the difference is. Okay, yeah, Stavon's not top 15. Okay. There's no one I, I think I would instantly say isn't in the top 15 that they have here. <sighs> Outside of Sean O'Malley, I'm sorry. He just hasn't beaten anyone yet to really uh, bring this through. Uh, Stamon is on a losing streak, losing to Valachvili and Jimmy Rivera, which, I mean, kind of is why this is a weird fight to have third from the top. And if you look at Nurmagomedov, of course, he's 3-1 and one in the UFC. His win over Justin Scoggins wasn't the most convincing, and additionally, Scoggins is not in the UFC anymore. And then he's beaten uh, Ramos and Mark Striegel, and Striegel, I'm pretty sure, has no UFC wins. I'm correct on that. And Ramos has had a pretty bumpy run in the UFC. I mean, he's had some good moments. You know, won his first three UFC fights before losing to Magomedov. But since then, his biggest win is Bill Algio. And when he's otherwise stepped up in competition with Laurent Murphy... And Zubair to uh, to Gugov, he's not had um, answers, so it's two guys in kind of a weird place in that regard. I I'm going to go with Nurmagomedov, but it's it, it's like I said, it's kind of this hope thing. I could totally st- see Stabon's methodical breakdown style totally rendering Saeed Nurmagomedov. Um, out of this fight. I could totally see it. And and we may very well get it. But I'm, I'm going to go optimistic and say. Nurmagomedov passes this test. And moves on to the next one. Uh, Hadolfo Vieira versus Wellington Terman. Two ways this fight can go. Uh, Vieira is the better fighter. In the sense that he's the better athlete. He's the better grappler. And if you're the better grappler. And you're fighting Wellington Terman. Uh, your your job is, is, is kind of done. Um, for you. If you look at Wellington Terman's record, beating Sam Alvey, losing to Bruno Silva, losing to Andrew Sanchez, beating Marcus Perez, losing to Carl Roberson, that's his UFC run. Uh, Perez is a good grappler, so it's not quite that simple. 
But if you look at it, Silva wasn't going to be out grappled by him. He had no confidence he could do it. Sanchez is a not necessarily a great grappler, grappler, but a good wrestler. And then Roberson is just a good athlete. Um, it seems like that should be over. But at the same time, Vieira does have incredibly um, concerning cardio. The loss to Anthony Hernandez was a great example of that. He looked a little more calm, a little bit more uh, ready, um, calm, collected, prepared when he fought Dustin Stolfus. <sighs> but I mean, short of him just gassing hard, I don't see Terman's path to victory. Um. I mean, granted, I don't think Terman's ever been submitted in MMA competition, but I know that um, in the lead up to the Bruno Silva fight, they talked about how he had lost a grappling match to to Bruno Silva and looked distinctly uncomfortable with the idea of fighting with someone out there. And Vieira's a way higher caliber of grappler. I just I don't think he's going to be mentally super ready for the fight and i think that's going to be a win for Vieira by submission i just think that the grappling discrepancy is something i don't have any faith in Termin to overcome even though Vieira is a guy you can definitely outlast and take the victory Ilya Taporia Charles Duran i'm going with Taporia i really like Charles Duran he's a hyper aggressive fighter he's uh he's relatively high fight iq when it comes to adjustments uh, he'll find weaknesses in people's games. He'll overwhelm people. He's had a great run in the OC, uh, coming off the win over Andre Yule. Yes, he is. But he's also lost to Andre Feely, Des Green, and Julian Arosa. Taporia is, I think, a big step above that kind of thing. He's got a great pressure grappling game. His stand-up is very well integrated into that game i jordan will give up takedowns and i think he'll end up on his back and he'll get finished either by submission or he'll get pounded out uh, ronnie barcelos versus uh victor henry not a fight i'm interested in really in any way i think barcelos will win that fight i think that henry i'm happy to see henry in the oc um 26 fight veteran it's good to see him get that shot but it's not a fight that fills me with any interest. And it's disappointing because Barcelos, in my opinion, should be headed to so much more. Was this supposed to be another fight originally? I'm looking at it. And I'm not seeing it uh, as that. Let's see if it's on Barcelos's page, maybe. Um, it's supposed to be Trevin Jones originally, which... wouldn't necessarily be much better um, it'd be a little better because at least with jones there is there's something there whereas with henry i don't think henry asks any athletic questions of barcelos i don't think he asks wrestling questions of barcelos i don't think he asks grappling questions of barcelos i don't think he asks striking questions of barcelos and i think barcelos will probably tko uh, Michael Morales, Trevin Giles. Michael Morales does not seem very good. I know he's 12-0 and 0, um, in everything and a contender series winner. Um, and maybe he's a lot better than I'm giving him credit for. But when you look at the records of the people he's faced, they tend not to be very good or very proven anyways. And um, I just think there's a ton of holes in his style. Like a ton, um, and uh, I'm. I mean, at the same time, I'm worried about Trevin Giles, who's had some very proven issues. Uh, the James Krause fight, a great example. The recent loss to Drikas Duplessis, another good example of that. But um, and and obviously guarding his neck when he lost back to back to Gerald Mershart and Zach Cummins. But I think. I think that he's I think he's got the better put together game than Morales and I think he's got the better and he, and he, he's very good athletically 
Um, he's a well-trained fighter, despite not being at necessarily the best camp in the world. Um, but, uh, similar to the Victor Henry Barcells fight, I don't see what questions Morales asks of Giles that he'll fail. Um, and I, I, I uh, as much as I've been somewhat disappointed in Giles's process, I have a feeling that he ha he he doesn't ask me any questions about himself that I think necessarily cause him to fail here. So I'm taking Giles. Um, we'll go with a submission. Giles has got some good ground games, and if you give him an opening, he'll take it. I think Morales will. Give him openings. So let's go with Giles by by submission. Jack uh, Della Mandalena. You can tell I'm not enthused by this undercard. Uh, Jack Della Mandalena, uh, Pete Rodriguez. Uh, Della Mandalena uh, has to be my picks. I, I just, I, I don't know much about Pete Rodriguez. I, there's not much for me to, to go on. He's a, he's a 4-0 fighter who, whose opponents have a combined eight and four record. Um, there's just nothing to go on there. It's all first round stoppages. I assume he has power. I assume he hits hard. Um, but uh, it's icon that he's fighting on, I guess is, is I guess the core problem. Um, I just, I, there's nothing to trust there. So Jack Della Mandalena, uh, Tony Gravely, uh, Shaman Oliveira. Uh, guy who won a split decision on the uh, Contender Series against Tony Gravely. Gravely has impressed me. I mean, there is definitely an opening to him. Uh, getting countered by Nate Manus is not a great look. Um, beating Anthony Burchak and Geraldo DeFreitas doesn't, doesn't mean that much. Um... The guy he beat on the Contender Series, Ray Rodriguez, has kind of been a, a bust. Lost to Brett Johns, who is, is a guy who has done way better than I expected. I guess this, I guess it's the easiest way to put it with with Brett Johns. Um, but yeah, I got to take him here. Oliveira doesn't doesn't offer a ton. Um, maybe he'll surprise me, but. Yeah, I'm going with Gravely by decision. Uh, Vanessa Demopoulos versus Silvio Gomez Juarez. <sighs> Gomez Juarez to win because I just, I don't think Demopoulos has a functional game. I think she has the physicality to, to be something. Um, I think someone said it pretty well when they said that she felt like a what happens when a bodybuilder tries to fight and i largely have to agree with that that assessment um that kind of is what it what it feels like um but it it, it inspires me in no way to pick her to win fights uh matt Ferrola versus uh Gennaro, uh Gennaro, uh valdez the concern with um for Vola is that there's an Eddie Alvarez effect with him where he is very prone to the flash knockdown slash KO out of the gate. Polo Reyes, uh, Terrence McKinney both found that. But Terrence McKinney is a hell of a finisher. Polo Reyes does hit very, very hard. Uh, I can't really say that Valdez has anything that leads me to believe that. I mean, maybe that 44-second knockout of Patrick White on the Contender Series should give me um, concern. But I'm not... I, it's um, it's sort of a similar situation to what I talked about with uh, Pete Rodriguez, but a much deeper one because he is 10-0. It's a lot of can crushing to come up to the big show and that develops confidence that develops a highlight reel but it doesn't develop critical thinking problem solving in a fight we saw that we've seen this a lot with um the Mokhtarian camp 
in Australia that brought up Nani Kasim, uh, the Mokhtarians, a bunch of other Australian fighters that promptly were uh, pretty bad despite having these very impressive on paper resumes. Um, and that's what it feels like here. So I'm, I'm taking Frivola. The only problem is Frivola does not finish people is the one problem. He's very much a decision guy since he's gotten to the UFC Has a couple of finishes on the regional scene over Josh Zuckerman, Mike D'Angelo and Terrence McDade. But even, even on the regional scene, he was still not that potent of a finisher. So we'll say, I'm going to say a decision because you've got Valdez who's never been finished for Volo's not really a finisher. Um, but there's just nothing there that I think Valdez threatens with beyond that first little bit, that flash KO propensity that we've seen with Frivola. Uh, Jasmine Josevedius and Kay Hansen. I've seen Jasmine fight. I wish I had more confidence, you know, repping the Canadian pride um, because there are two Canadians on this card and I'm picking against both of them because I got to go Kay Hansen. Kay Hansen to me is a very good prospect. I like a lot about her game. I like the physicality. I thought she beat Corey McKenna. Um, I will state that the height does draw pause because Kay Hansen is five foot two, and Jasmine uh, Josephidius is five seven. And five inches is always a bit weird. And to a degree, the difficulties that Hansen had in the Corey McKenna fight were at range. And Corey McKenna is only five foot three. So I definitely can see the reach being a problem, being a question. Hansen fighting at, at flyweight does long-term uh, worry me. I think she needs to get her weight comfortably under control and get to 115 because I think that is where she will succeed. Um, but I am taking her in this fight. I think she is kind of just better everywhere on a technical level. Like I said, I like the physicality of her game. I like the decision making of her game because she does solve problems. She does adapt. She does adjust. If you give her looks, she's going to figure some of them out. Um, so, I mean, don't get me wrong. That five inches is really concerning. Um, what is the betting odds on this one? I'm wondering to my, Ooh, minus 255. Yeah, no, 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 not, not, not recommending any bets on that one, um, but I am I am taking Kay Hansen to win. Um, probably by decision because I don't I don't see her finishing this fight. Um, but I have I've really liked what Hansen brings because yes, she lost to Corey McKenna, but she had a very close fight with Aaron Blanchfield. I thought she won the McKenna fight. I've been pretty damn impressed. She does have this loss to Magdalena uh, Sarmova. I don't think I've seen that fight. Maybe that would draw me a little bit of pause. But I've been pretty, pretty impressed with everything I've seen from Kay Hansen so far. I think she takes the fight. Uh, sorry for like not the largest breakdowns here, but... I didn't want the video to be super, super long. And this undercard just does not intrigue or interest me. Um, let's see if there's any good money to be made. Um, just looking at these fights that might be worth a bet. Might have something to go on here. Maybe. Kind of. Probably not. <laughs> but let's have a look. Um, I mean, you can get you can get Cody Staman at like plus one seventy five. That 
that's probably worth something. I, I think that's a fight that is very winnable. Um, I, 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 part of my, the, the technical aspect of my brain is, is really not happy with picking Saeed and Nurmagomedov to win that fight, but it, it's there. Um, Charles Jardine's like a plus 400 underdog. I do think that's a little bit wide. I don't think we've seen enough about Tapori to trust him at like minus five to 600. And I guess my my pick is I am picking betting odds underdog Trevin Giles uh, to win. So maybe that's where you go uh, for the money. But that's it. Um, I'm very interested with the main. Um, the, the main event intrigues me. Moreno Figueredo is going to be a very good fight, I think, no matter how it goes. Um, there's always a morbid fascination with Michelle Pejea. Uh Nurmagomedov Staman is definitely worth looking forward to, but like everything else on the card, not really. It could deliver. It could end up being a lot better. It is one of those fights where it is one of those cards where a lot of the guys I'm not enthused by. It's I'm not enthused by them because I haven't seen them fight quality competition. They could be amazing. They could. The, uh, Michael Morales could come in and 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 do some good stuff. Although I, I I really think he's got a lot of problems. Pete Rodriguez could come in and do some good things. Um, Gennaro Valdez could come in and do some good things. Um, but there's nothing I've seen from them in their fights that make me believe that they are really worth a tremendous amount of hype. Uh, same with Jack uh, De La Mandalena, um, and um, I guess that's about it. Uh, should have been a better fight card because I know initially uh, Jared Cannonier and Derek Brunson was booked for this card. That didn't happen. Viviana Rougeau versus Alexa Grasso was booked for this card. That would have been pretty good. Um, even Pollyanna Botello versus Jiang uh, Kim. That could have been fun. And Ilya Taporia versus Movzar Evilev. Oh, yes, please. I would have loved, I would have loved that fight. But instead, we are getting um, Taporia versus Charles Jordan, which I, I do think will be fun. I just think it'll be anticlimactic in the sense that the questions I want asked of Tuborio are not going to be asked by Charles Oliveira. So we'll leave it at that. Enjoy the fight card. And uh, I'll see you next time right here.